Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to another JetBrains Rider webinar. Uh, my name is Khalid. I am a developer advocate here at JetBrains, mostly focusing on Rider and ReSharper. Uh, so yeah, I'm really excited about today's webinar and today's guest. Uh, I was just talking to him in the green room, uh, very experienced uh, in the technology today. And I'm really curious to kind of hear his tips and tricks when it comes to Blazor. Um, but before we get started, uh, let me go through some housekeeping things uh, and uh, then I'll introduce our guests. So uh, first of all, uh, we are on YouTube. Uh, and if you're watching us live right now, please feel free to ask any questions that you have. Uh, I'll be keeping track of them and we'll be asking uh, our guest these questions at the end. So uh, please interact with us. We really love these questions and uh, we love hearing uh, them from you. So there's that. Uh, a big question that often gets asked, hey, is this session being recorded? Yes, uh, it's on YouTube. It is being recorded. Uh, feel free to ask the question, but I'm answering it right now and I'll answer it again if you ask it, but it is being recorded. You can watch this later uh, on YouTube. You might be watching it later right now. This might be the future. So uh, <laughs> on that note, uh, I'd like to introduce our guest uh, today, uh, Principal Consultant at Accenture, uh, Brandon. Uh, great to have you here. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm excited. Uh, first time on YouTube. YouTube, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to have to uh, plug a bunch of mattresses and maybe some VPNs for us. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, uh, it's it's okay. The YouTube life is okay. So, <laughs> on that joke, uh, are you are you ready to kind of give your presentation? Yeah, I think uh, kind of got a lot of things I want to hit. So we should probably just jump right into it. All right, um, the stage is yours. I'll keep track of chat, and I'll be here if you need anything. But um, good luck. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, so I guess thanks everyone for coming out to uh, hear me talk about Blazor best practices borrowed from React.js. Uh, what I essentially mean by that is I'm going to try to share a handful of kind of practices and patterns and some lessons learned, I guess, from several years of working in sort of rich, stateful web UIs built with component based JavaScript frameworks. Um, this link right here uh, is a link to the slides. Um, this is just a web page. So if you want to follow along there, um, throughout the slides, I'll have some links out to like other resources. Uh, so that makes it easy to kind of click through those or uh, read more about certain things uh, if you so feel like it. Uh, I don't know if uh, we'll have that link in the description later. Um, so I guess it'll be in the description down below. Always wanted to say that, but. Uh, uh, yeah, so real quick, just a little bit about me. Like Khalid mentioned, my name is Brandon Pugh. I've been web devving for like over 12 years now, I think. And uh, I've been a software consultant for eight of those years, uh, first at Headspring and now at Accenture in their uh, product and platform engineering services group, um, or PPEDS, as we call ourselves. Um, but my professional interests kind of include everything web dev related, UI, UX, automated testing, Git, developer tooling, and productivity. So feel free to at me or reach out uh, if you want to geek out about any of those topics um, or just exchange uh, editor extension recommendations. Um, and then just a real quick kind of level set, some expectations of what this talk is and isn't. Um, it's not really going to go into too much of the basics of Blazor. Um, so ideally, having some kind of experience um, uh, or maybe some intro knowledge uh, will help you kind of get the most of this talk. Um, there's already a lot of great content out there um, that you should definitely check out um, if you want to just find out more about Blazor itself. Um, but you don't have to have any React experience um, or have even heard of React before, if that's still possible. Um, but this is um, really like, even if you're not a Blazor dev um, or just curious about Blazor, um, or if you work in the UI in general, or if um, you're afraid you're going to have to start working in the UI, uh, hopefully there's a nugget or two in here for everyone. So now that that's out of the way, um, the first thing I kind of want to touch on is state, um, because state is hard. Um, hopefully everyone 
that's not a controversial statement um, because it's almost 2023 and it's still the most common advice you hear for troubleshooting anything tech related is have you tried turning it off and on again? Uh, so uh, there's a reason why, uh, especially in like the functional programming communities, you hear this expression of shared mutable state is the root of all evil. Um, and they're probably not far off. Like there's a reason why we're always having to try refreshing the page or restarting our phones or the router. Um, and uh, that's because we have to manage a lot of state in our software and especially in um, these more rich UIs. And as these UIs get more complex, we're just having to manage more and more state. So um, that's kind of the, the first thing I want to, to talk about because I see, I see that kind of pretty common with new Blazor devs. Um, and one of those things is this first tip where um, you shouldn't be trying to sync state, you should try to derive it first. Uh, and so to kind of show what I mean by that, uh, if we look at this pretty simple component here, that's obviously a button, and you can tell that the text here is dynamic based on some property. Uh, so if you go to look at that to figure out what that displays, uh, you're probably likely to see that property defined like this within the component class. Uh, you see it's set to create first, and then uh, there's this is edit Boolean that you see show up again later down here. Uh, you see the submit button text also gets changed to update um, at the same time that is edit is equal to true. Um, and this is kind of a code smell sometimes referred to as data clumping where you start to see uh, these same bits of state or variables that always get changed together. And uh, you may already start to see why this can cause issues because for one, we already had to kind of look in a few different places just to figure out what the text uh, can actually be and what determines that it can be that way. And as you start adding more bits of state, that have to change, um, this is gonna get more kind of unwieldy. Uh, and so looking at this, we can kind of determine that there's probably like two modes on this form, um, whether or not you're editing or creating a new entity like a pizza order or something. Uh, and so if you're updating one, the text on the button changes to update instead of create. Um, but now if you want to come in here and make any changes to this code, you sort of need to immediately understand the relationship between these bits of data to be able to change the code safely. And if is edit has to be changed in a third place, now you have to make sure to also update these other fields. And sort of a quick fix to mitigate that uh, is to just inline that calculation right into the market itself. Um, this is pretty easy code to reason about. You can immediately see what values the text can be and what determines what that value is. Um, and of course, if that got even a little more complex, then you can easily extract, extract that out into its own method. Um, slightly more extreme example is um, probably seen a uh, disabled attribute used pretty frequently on things like buttons or submit buttons. Uh, and so I'm sure you can imagine yourself getting assigned a bug report where the user wasn't able to submit a form because the button was disabled. Um, they may or may not have included detailed steps that they took to get into the state, or you might have just said button's not working. But uh, you found the button, and you see is submit allowed is a promising uh, thing to dig into. So uh, you might just hit F12 or right click and go to definition. Uh, and that takes you here. This is declaration defaults to true. Like, that's not super helpful. So then you find all usages, and you start going through them one by one. So like maybe it was in this method call, uh, or maybe it was down here, uh, or it could have been here. Maybe this one down here. Um, so hopefully you start to get the point that it is much harder to reason about what values a particular property can have or what controls a bit of markup when you have to follow the flow of the entire component and find all the places where uh, and different methods in that component that are updating this value and try to reason about that as opposed to simply calling a method on is disabled. Now, when you go to definition, 
um, when uh, something like this is typically probably controlled or determined by core business logic, uh, which is always a good idea to abstract out into uh, something like a domain entity. Um, and now go to definition, we'll take you straight to that method that encapsulates all the logic. And you can easily set breakpoints in there to see when the values change or how often it gets referenced as opposed to having to add a breakpoint maybe in every method in that component to try to follow that. Here's a couple more examples of common sort of instances where you really can just derive the state instead of trying to store the full name by concatenating first and last name every time uh, it updates or calculating totals or summing up lists of items. You don't wanna to have to update the total every time you uh, have any callback function like on add items or on delete items. We just calculate it right here um, in the markup or if that has displayed in multiple places, again, we can abstract that out into shared methods or components. So essentially if you're about to create a new piece of state you have to stop and ask yourself if you can derive it from an existing piece first. Um, the less state you have to manage, the better. Fewer bugs, and again, um, in my opinion, much easier to reason about, especially as your components start to grow. A uh, common pushback I get is that um, people think, is this going to make the UI slow? And the short answer is no. Um, these types of calculations are fast. Like the runtime is optimized for these types of things. and especially in a UI, it's not very likely that it's going to be the bottleneck in why an application feels slow, especially when you're talking about um, expensive operations like DOM manipulation and network requests and that sort of thing. Um, in the rare instance, for me at least, where in a calculation actually is fairly expensive, um, I would recommend reaching for a pattern called memoization first, uh, which is, um, essentially a concept where it's been around for a long time, but it's just caching the output of a function based on inputs. Um, so as far as the market concerned, it's still calling, just calling a method, um, but the output's getting cached. So it doesn't have to do that expensive operation every time. And this is pretty common in the React space. Uh, React even comes uh, out of the box with a use memo hook or utility method for memoizing functions. Uh, and Redux has reselect. Uh, and so on. So I'd highly recommend looking into that more if you find yourself in that situation. Uh, the next question you might have is, well, where should I put my state? Um, and it's all about co-locating things. Um, and what I mean by that is placing the code as close to where it's relevant as possible. Uh, and again, not a new concept. Um, you may have seen that in regards to like variables, variable declarations within functions. Um, or concepts like feature folders in ASP.NET, where you put related code files with each other instead of in different places. Um, and the same thing applies uh, to state uh, within your component hierarchy. Um, again, in the React community, there's this concept of lifting state. Um, there's even an uh, official documentation page in the React docs that discusses this where, um, you know, as soon as state has to be shared between components, uh, you need to lift it up into the closest common ancestor. So that just means that if the component doesn't have to care about it, then you don't want to put that state there, if that makes sense. So that's why you don't just put all your state in the root component of your application and pass it all the way down to the different components. You want to start with, if this is the only component that uses it, I define the state in there, and then I lift it up. Um, again, like a lot of the concepts that I'm going to touch on here, um, this could be an entire talk in and of itself. Um, so I'm just briefly kind of touching into this. Um, but again, uh, there's a lot of content out there to read more, especially in the React space. Um, but um, I don't want that to scare you if you don't have any experience with React, um, because a lot of it I found is eerily close or applicable to Blazor as well. <laughs> to kind of illustrate that, uh, Ken C. Dodds, who's a uh, prolific kind of community member in the React space, put together this cool workflow for where to put React state. And you can see I really only had to change the names of a couple concepts in here to mirror it to Blazor, um, which I think is pretty cool. 
Um, so I'd highly recommend giving this uh, his blog post a read. Not sure why uh, that displayed like that, but uh, web dev is hard, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, one thing though is this doesn't really um, address uh, libraries like Redux or any kind of global state management. Uh, that's kind of the next level up. That's sort of when all of this kind of fails and you have this kind of global state that disparate parts of app sort of need to subscribe to. Um, but that introduces a lot of complexity in my opinion and a lot of applications may not need it. I haven't felt the need to, to reach for a library like that in uh, Bla my Blazor projects yet. There is one called Fluxor out there. Um, I have a link to later, but um, definitely start with this um, and kind of layer on uh, complexity as, as your app needs it. Uh, the next kind of cool concept is this one about making impossible states impossible. And if you haven't heard that before, um, here's a quick sort of example to illustrate it. Uh, this is a slightly modified version of the uh, weather forecasting component that kind of comes included with one of the default Visual Studio Blazor templates. Uh, so it's just kind of showcasing, you know, fetching data with Blazor. Uh, so fairly standard stuff, you have this, uh, loading markup, where if you have the loading Boolean set to true, then it displays that, or you display an error message, or you loop over the forecasts that you fetched and render those. And then all the magic kind of happens in the uninitialized method where um, you need to fetch uh, the data, you make the API requests, you update the loading Booleans, you have that catch block to Set an error message if the request fails for any reason. Um, and that's basically it. <clears throat> you run it, looks good to go. Um, you definitely added this is loading at the end, even though you forgot the first time. And it works. Uh, but then um, shortly after, you get new feature requests to now allow the user to be able to click a button to refresh the weather whenever they want. So you think, no big deal. It's my specialty. So now you pull that out into the separate load data method that you call on initialized. And then also when the user clicks the button and you think you're good, but if you've been in the situation before, you may have already uh, noticed the subtle bug that has been introduced now because now there's a new state, which is when you make subsequent requests and then there's an error failure or an error message and then the user makes another request, and this time it succeeds, we're not resetting the error message when we make another request. So now, even though the new request succeeds, the error message never gets cleared out and just always stays there until there's another exception. Um, and this is a pretty easy trap to fall into. Um, it's happened to me a couple of times. Um, now this is on my checklist of things to look for in a code review. Uh, when reviewing this type of code. And uh, fortunately, there's a fairly easy like first step you can kind of take to mitigate this. And that's just introducing the concept of a status um, and then a status enum. So because we recognize that these separate states are mutually exclusive, you can only be in one at a time, which was the, the bug we had before. We managed to be in the error state and the success or loaded state at the same time which should be impossible. Um, and this enum now models that. So now instead of a Boolean, we just have the status enum. And then here we just change the status depending on whether or not we're loading or we've succeeded or failure, failed. We don't have to reset the status message um, because that's just implicit when we transition states. And as a cool side effect, uh, we can even simplify the markup a bit now uh, with just a simple switch case on that enum instead of a bunch of different if or if else's. Uh, and this makes it clear that these are the different states, you can only have one at a time. And, um, and we've sort of eliminated an entire sort of category of bugs potentially in this component. And then an even cooler kind of side effect is that we're now one step kind of closer to modeling our UI as a finite state machine. 
Um, and that's actually where I first heard the expression of making possible states impossible was from a talk at React Rally by David Kershid, uh, who's the author of the XState library for JavaScript. Um, he gave a talk called Infinitely Better UIs with Finite Automata. And uh, it's a pretty interesting talk. Uh, again, I highly recommend it, even if you don't uh, know React. Um, it's, again, state machines are a very old concepts, uh, but applying them to UIs, uh, I found has a lot of merit, especially as uh, you start, when you start recognizing these disparate states and your com the complexity grows in those components that have to respond to these different states. Um, I've, there's definitely been some pretty hairy, uh, at least JavaScript components that I've leveraged uh, X state uh, successfully. Uh, haven't had the need to reach for it with uh, Blazor yet. But um, if nothing else, I'd recommend to stop using is loading booleans. Um, they're pretty hard to get right, or and you'll likely find edge cases, or your users will find these edge cases, um, and then you just have to keep adding uh, if blocks. So wherever possible, try to think of other kind of constructs that can model that state. Um, even something like a global loading service uh, that sort of manages that based on the request state. Um, so if you want to explore state machines uh, for more complex scenarios, you get xState for JavaScript is an excellent library. Stateless is one for .NET. Um, there's some tutorials out there on integrating that with, with Blazor as well. And then I recommend uh, David Kershid's talk as well. Next um, is the concept of reusable components, uh, which is sort of, to me sort of the bread and butter of these UI-like frameworks or component-based UI frameworks. And uh, there's a lot to dig in to this, but the, uh, the first kind of concept I want to touch on is that you, as exciting as it can be to sort of break everything out into a component. Um, there is some, some nuance or discretion you want to have around deciding when something should be a separate component or when to break something out. Um, and that's kind of just like with um, similar constructs in programming like methods and classes or functions. Uh, it's really just an abstraction. And the first question you need to ask yourself is, what is that abstraction? Um, and a good rule of thumb is, can you name it, like that concept? If it doesn't have a name, then you may not be creating the abstraction you think it is. Um, and uh, that's kind of been the discussion around that lately I've seen is this, the discussing it as dry versus wet. Um, if you haven't heard those acronyms, just stands for don't repeat yourself, uh, which is the concept of avoiding duplication um, by creating abstractions versus wet, which is a newer thing that's kind of come up in response to too much abstraction, uh, which stands for write everything twice. Uh, and is kind of a, a general suggestion of waiting to create an abstraction. Like if you find yourself copying duplicate code more than two times, then you need to stop and abstract that out. Um, and, um, what I'm essentially going to recommend is that you kind of want to lean, if anything, lean more towards wet by default. Um, but I'm not just going to refer to everything as dry and wet. Um, and so uh, Sandy Metz uh, in one of her talks gave this excellent quote that says, uh, duplication is far cheaper than the wrong abstraction, uh, which is again why I think you kind of want to lean towards um, not creating an abstraction first until you really kind of recognize that um, either that pain point or that concept sort of uh, showing itself more and more. Um, and some, some quick heuristics on what that might look or feel like. Um, so if, you have, if you're too wet, if you have too much kind of duplication, uh, the general pain point you'll start to feel is that you have to keep making the same change in multiple places. Um, and the likely bug is that you forgot to make a change in a place or something that wasn't obvious. So there's a new feature request, and then the bug comes in that, oh, it works in this one place, but not over here, uh, which is not great, but not terrible. Uh, as opposed to if you're too dry, um, what will happen is um, either this method or 
shared component uh, just keeps growing in complexity. You have to keep adding conditionals, special cases, extra parameters. Um, and then it just becomes that component that no one wants to touch uh, because it's used everywhere. And it's really complex, hard to reason about or fully um, uh, wrap your head around. And it breaks cases that you didn't even realize it was being used at for or in different places of your application. And then the bug, of course, is that you unexpectedly break things and now you've introduced regressions. And that, to me, reduces confidence in your application a lot faster, especially for end users, uh, when things that used to work before don't anymore. And um, it seems like an unrelated thing. Um, and that also is scary. Uh, you, you don't want to be scared to touch uh, your code. So um, with all that said, um, there are plenty of instances where you want to create abstractions. And a common one, especially in uh, UIs, is anything around accessibility. Um, so if y'all indulge me for a mini side rant, um, for a long time in my career, I actually didn't really have to care too much about accessibility. Uh, most of my clients, uh, whenever we would ask them like they had any accessibility concerns or requirements, uh, they would typically say no. Um, they'd be like, that's not something we have to worry about. A lot of these were you know, internal applications, non-public facing, but still for some sizable organizations. Um, and I eventually realized more and more that what they're really saying is that, well, they don't currently have anyone with any sort of disabilities or accessibility needs, um, but they don't care about ever needing anyone that has those requirements, or they essentially aren't gonna be able to hire anyone now if they have some disability where they can't use these applications that they need to do their job, um, which uh, is obviously illegal. And uh, there's been more and more cases of you know, things like the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, here in the US getting applied to um, websites and web applications, Domino's being a famous case where they got sued because of an inaccessible website. And so um, the last couple of years or so, uh, I've really started to change the way I kind of approach this. And I think as an industry, we should start to treat it more like we do now with testing and security, where we don't hopefully ask our clients like, oh, do you want tests for this? Like, we just assume that's part of what is developing good software. That's just part of the cost of delivering something good to the client. Um, so um, I have an idea for like a next talk of making sort of your applications accessible by default. Um, and this is kind of um, one concept that kind of falls under that which is um, things like um, web forms. Um, this is a pretty common input text build. I think this is an example from somewhere in the Blazor documentation. Um, it's fairly straightforward, um, but it's not really accessible at all. Um, to make this accessible, this is more what it has to look like. Um, sort of kind of at a minimum, you're gonna want to add these attributes. Um, the label has to be associated with the input. Um, you have to do that with an ID. Uh, you have to set the for attribute. You have to um, associate the validation message with it. Um, and, um, and you're gonna have to, to test that this markup sort of works, uh, especially with things like screen readers um, or keyboard navigation. And so uh, not to scare you because um, I mean, accessibility is hard, um, especially striving to be 100% accessible and compliant. Um, but there really is a lot of low hanging fruit um, and a kind of 80-20 principle that you can follow to really reduce a lot of the annoyances that um, users with various disabilities experience in a lot of applications. Um, and uh, web forms is a very common source of frustration um, for users. But fortunately, by creating an abstraction over our form inputs, we can now programmatically generalize 
all the accessibility requirements that we have for things like input components. So here's that same bit of markup, but now things like the ID and the associated attributes are all just handled for us. And so that previous markup can now be simplified down into these three lines that is all you need for any field in your application. So now all the individual developers on your team don't have to be accessibility experts. They can just use these sort of base components that you've created. Um, and so this is kind of like my, my go-to, like on any kind of project now starting, uh, especially a Greenfield project is creating these set of base components, especially for things like form inputs. Because outside of accessibility, you're likely to have a number of other sort of concerns specific to your application around branding um, or just layout of your forms. And you kind of want to encapsulate all this in here. And you may have noticed even things like whether or not there are colons on the input labels or the labels for the inputs. I once had a client, made by through a project, decide that they wanted to get rid of all the colons in the application. So ever since then, I no longer hard code my colons. And so um, I'll try to start making t-shirts uh, for that. But um, to me, this is, this is a really cool thing about these components. This is to me what HTML really should have been is this sort of encapsulation of all that logic in a very simple interface. Um, another thing uh, that's really nice to abstract out is third-party libraries. So you may have eventually decided to pull in a component library like Mudblazer. Uh, it seems to be one of the more popular open source component libraries uh, for Blazor. And so that same input text you, we had a minute ago can now be just represented uh, using the mud text field component. And um, now you only need to set this in your um, uh, custom app uh, text field component, excuse me. And um, you get the same markup, except now you didn't have to change every field in your application. You just swapped out the implementation detail and it all still works. Um, Assuming that you did some research first and ensured that you know, your component library does create accessible markup, um, fortunately, a lot of them do these days uh, since it's becoming, there's been a lot more awareness kind of raised um, in the industry. Um, a quick side rant also on formatting. Uh, this is, to me, my favorite uh, way to format component markup. Uh, this kind of comes from the it's more or less standard in the React space, especially. Uh, tools like Prettier now do this um, out of the box. Um, and the nice thing about this is each, um, with the exception of maybe when you only have one parameter or attribute on an element, uh, this makes it easy to see them all. Things with like component libraries on like traditional HTML um, tend to have a lot of attributes or a lot of parameters. And so, Having them each on their own line obviously makes it more readable, but also for things like version control, now anytime you need to make a change to one of these or add a new one, that's only one line in the diff. Um, and so it makes it easier to review, but also to go back and look at things like git blame can tell you, oh, why was this parameter changed to this? As opposed to being on one line, now every time that line changes, um, it's hard to drill into specific specific ones. Um, Ryder actually does a pretty good job of formatting it like this, um, except for the pet peeve of putting this closing tag on the same uh, line, but um, maybe they will take my emails to heart and implement that. Um, but um, why might you want to wrap your third-party libraries though? You might be thinking that's a lot of properties to do, um, to sort of pass along. Um, but the obvious one is that you're much less tightly coupled to this dependency. Um, I know we all like to think that we'll never have to swap out a dependency like our component library, but um, given the number of times I've had to do that and replace um, 100 JavaScript import statements, um, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> and, uh, and I know JavaScript is more infamous for the kind of explosion <laughs> in third-party libraries and the churn uh, in that space. 
Uh, but Blazor is still a relatively new uh, technology. And for me, at least, it's kind of hard to see or to know uh, which of these new sort of projects are going to be maintained for any amount of time. Uh, and so when you minimize the places in your application that directly reference these libraries, um, it just makes it so much easier to swap those out. Um, even something as complex as like a modal dialogue, um, I've been able to do that before um, by creating these sort of wrapper components. Um, of course, things like grid components um, are fairly complex. So there is some amount of trade-off you have to do and how much effort you want to spend in creating these wrappers. Um, but you don't have to uh, sort of map one-to-one -one everything in the component, the third party's API uh, with your own components, because you probably only really need a subset of those for your application. And um, you probably want to enforce some consistency in um, how you use that. So in this case here, this variant property uh, on the mud text field actually completely changes the style of the input from floating to filled to outlined. Um, and so you probably made a decision or your designers did that we're only gonna have this style in the application. And this lets you enforce that. Um, and at the same time, giving uh, your team members um, a lot less sort of fields to look through. If they uh, do control space uh, to get the IntelliSense for the properties, they can see what's using your application um, and what options they should have, um, which leads to just kind of a consistent visual and UX experience throughout your application. Um, but it makes code review a lot easier because now you don't have to check every instance where they might be using these third party components and sort of make sure that they're using them in the right way um, or not adding uh, features that um, they don't need to or you don't want to support. It's a lot easier to notice like, oh, I see that you modified something in our shared folder that is our global sort of base set of components. Um, so then you can have that conversation like, do we need this uh, to add this property? And how are we going to support that later? Um, potentially with a third, a different library. Um, so again, this can potentially save you a lot of heartache uh, down the road. And the nice thing is that, again, the API everywhere in your application still looks the same because you're wrapping, you're hiding all that complexity or the implementation details in this abstraction. Um, another cool feature that I don't see sort of discussed or used enough, at least so far in my experience with Blazor, um, is the concept of render fragments, uh, which you may be familiar with uh, if you worked with Razor in the past. Um, but that's essentially this cool concept of just having a regular method return a chunk of markup, like Razor, um, and it can be passed around through methods and just render directly into your component. Um, this is pretty common excuse me, in the React space. And that's to me what kind of makes Razor and JSX in React uh, so powerful because in the end, they just get, it all gets compiled down to JavaScript or C Sharp in the case of Razor. Um, and that's what lets you do this. You can, it looks like you just have this markup right within your functions and then you're just passing that around. Um, but it gets compiled down to method calls. Um, which to me is much more powerful than something like Angular that just tries to shoehorn in some templating language into HTML. Like that's just all strings. But here you get um, all the strong typing with the ease of just writing markup instead of method calls. Um, this example is actually taken from the official Blazor docs uh, on the page about performance best practices. Um, where they recommend if you only need to, if you're creating a new component just to reuse some duplicated markup, um, you actually can really only, or you only need to just create a little helper method to return uh, that markup as a render fragment. And this actually will improve your performance because there is some overhead. Uh, to rendering a component and setting the parameters on that component, uh, which for the most part isn't really a big issue, except when you're talking about 
uh, potentially rendering hundreds or thousands of components in a page, uh, especially in like a loop or something like a grid. In this case, a bunch of chat messages. Um, if you don't need to manage state within that component, then you can really just have a method call. And this speeds up, or this removes a lot of overhead, which is pretty negligible, but again, adds up when you're talking about thousands of components. Uh, but the other cool thing is that you can even sort of create this sort of utility class. Um, and as long as it's a razor file, you can have these static methods that return uh, just little bits of shared markup, reusable markup uh, throughout your application. Um, something as simple as rendering an icon, because again, whenever you render icons, you want to have these accessibility attributes um, to make them uh, accessible to people with screen readers. And then again, you can compose these together just like function calls, where if we want to render a Boolean with a particular type of icon, we can just call the render icon uh, that then calls, uh, returns that markup for the particular Boolean that we want. Um, and this is an instance where, again, in a grid, we just wanted to render Booleans as check, uh, check icons. And uh, this removes a lot of overhead for what would be a pretty simple component. Testing, uh, again, huge topic, but um, if you walk away with just one concept, um, it's this sort of pithy quote from Guillermo Rausch, who's the creator of Next.js, uh, where he said, write tests, not too many, mostly integration. Um, this is also kind of the philosophy I started to follow um, in my backend tests as well. Um, and the what kind of came out of that was this popular library just called testing library in the UI space um, that kind of has this principle of uh, trying to make your tests resemble production as much as possible, then you'll have a lot of confidence that you know, your software will actually work because your tests are passing. Um, and it got so popular that uh, the community has sort of built out, this is a, uh, the menu from the testing library documentation, and you can see all of the sort of frameworks that it supports now, uh, including end-to-end -end testing libraries like Cypress and uh, um, blank, uh, Playwright is the, the new end-to-end -end one from Microsoft that doesn't have a specific uh, matching API from the testing library, but it has a lot of the same methods uh, to achieve what it does. Um, and what it does is it really focuses on testing from the user's perspective and avoiding testing implementation details. And you want to mock as little as possible. So really only mocking sort of like your network requests. Um, but everything else, you just render everything as is. Um, so what that might look like is um, this is the first two lines are taken from the B unit documentation, which is um, essentially the de facto testing framework for uh, testing components in Blazor. It's an awesome framework. Uh, but the API is really kind of focused, and the examples are kind of focused on testing the markup, um, which to me has always felt like an implementation detail. Um, when I'm testing the user's behavior, like as a user, I don't care really that this render is an H1 tag. Um, I just want to see what the heading is. I want to know what the page is about. So instead of this approach where you query for something in the DOM and then make sure the market matches what you expect, um, you instead query for the text that you're expecting and then assert that it was able to find that text. And so in this case, this test will pass even if you completely refactor the way you display this. You could change this just to a paragraph or an H2 or anything like that. Again, that's an implementation detail, um, unless you're trying to, to verify that it renders the way it's supposed to, but that's an entirely different category of tests. Um, um, unfortunately, Blazor doesn't, or BUnit doesn't really have that API, um, but, um, you can easily sort of extend it with um, some quick extension methods. This is one I threw together 
pretty quickly to be able to get a input from a label text. And this is a method in the um, from the DOM testing library um, that is used a lot, especially with forms. And this pretty much mimics the uh, that same interface that you get, where all you have to do is pass in some label text, and it will get you the the input. And then, of course, if it doesn't find it, it will actually output all of the markup, uh, which makes debugging pretty helpful. Um, and this is kind of a sort of small example of what that might look like, where you have an account form component that you just render with the unit, and then you need to find a input to enter in the customer name, and then you enter that customer name. You find the button to save it. You click it, and then that would submit the save via an API request back to your server. And that's what um, this HTTP client up here sort of mocks out. Um, this is actually uh, an example of an extension method to that from the B unit documentation. Um, but essentially lets you mock out the response, but also assert that it did call that and made that request like you were expecting. And so the, the cool thing about this is that this really mimics what, as a user, you would be looking for on this page. Uh, when you come to this form, you're going to look for customer name, because you know you need to enter in the name. You're going to type in the name, and then you're going to look for a button called Save and click that button. Um, however that those inputs get rendered is all implementation details. You don't need to know that it was an actual button component. It could have been a div. Um, but if it had the role of button, then this will also return that button. Um, and the sort of side benefit or fringe benefit to that um, is that it also ensures that your markup is accessible. And that's also a big guiding principle of the testing library. Uh, library. And um, all of their APIs sort of follow that. So it's based on um, querying via the roles that um, assistive technologies would use. Um, and so if your markup is accessible, then you'll be able to query for these components. Um, this is what that form could look like. And so this might seem like a sort of high, very high level component to write a test for, especially if you're more used to things like unit testing, more low, lower level components. You may have tried to write tests for each of these components. Um, whereas this is kind of more of an integration test. Um, we care about how this form renders everything with all of these components. Excuse me. And again, that saves you from caring about the implementation details. Um, if we go back to our, our example earlier, where we swapped out um, our original implementation with one from a third party component, um, the additional benefit to this is our tests didn't have to change. We could have made this change, which completely changes the underlying markup. But from an end user's perspective, like the inputs might look a little nicer to me, but I'm still going to use the form the same way. And so my tests should reflect that. That's what they should be focused on testing. Um, did it render this validation error in this particular state? Um, did it let me find it um, by this label text? Um, and not only that, but then when I make this change, now my tests can give me additional confidence that I didn't break anything by making this, uh, swapping out this implementation. And I didn't have to go change my tests um, or the hundreds of tests I may have over my application to make that change. So a um, few testing resources uh, for you to kind of dig into. Again, BUnit um, is an awesome test uh, framework for BUnit, especially even if you do um, uh, prefer sort of lower level unit tests, um, which are good for something like your more um, base level components where you are sort of really manipulating markup, then 
that is what you want to assert on. Um, testing library, I think, is uh, worth looking into to kind of give you an idea for uh, the types of methods and things that you should be querying for if you want to adopt this more uh, user-centric approach to testing UIs. Um, and Test Playground is a cool site that actually lets you um, play around with markup, and it will suggest the types of queries that you should be using to uh, test it effectively and to ensure that uh, you have a, some level of accessibility in your UI. Um, Playwright is a end-to-end -end testing framework for Microsoft. Uh, I've been wanting to dig into this more because uh, the the biggest downside I found to BUnit so far is the fact that um, it doesn't actually execute JavaScript in the components. It has a sort of mocked uh, JS interrupt implementation, um, which for some third-party components sort of makes some of their components just not work. So you kind of have to mock those out or kind of work around that. Um, whereas with an end-to-end -end test, you would get that benefit. Um, and a lot of the newer frameworks like Playwright and Cypress have actually kind of been blurring the line between component tests and end-to-end -end tests because they now have the concept of a component test where they'll just render in a component um, that still only uh, works with their JavaScript SDKs and JavaScript libraries. Um, but it'd be pretty cool to see that sort of applied to, to Blazor components as well. Um, uh, and I'm a big fan of TDD, so I kind of recommend uh, this uh, YouTube video from Kenzie Dodds where he demonstrates how an approach like this uh, can even help you sort of test drive uh, your components when you're building those out. Um, and that is it. I think came in just under time. Um, again, any feedback is uh, welcome. Uh, leave comments, message me. Um, and then uh, I have some last uh, bit of resources here on this slide. Uh, again, uh, you can find all this on my blog or at the the link here, we'll pull up these slides. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. That was really, really cool. I mean, uh, the first thing that kind of comes to mind is like, you're definitely a consultant that has seen things. So <laughs> it's like, these are hard learned lessons. And it's like, even though we fit it into basically an hour, it's probably years of uh, running into these issues and kind of problem solving. So that's really cool to see. Um, what, one of the first questions uh, I, I think um, uh, Patrick asked, uh, he struggles with a blazer when state is shared across pages, but they don't necessarily share a common ancestor. You talked about um, promoting uh, state to a common ancestor, but have you run into situations where uh, you don't have a common ancestor, but maybe there's like a system-wide piece of state that you need to share to all components? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, uh, that's you know, one of the first roadblocks you kind of run into. Um, and uh, there's a couple of approaches you can take. Uh, with Blazor, the, the first one can just be a... Um, a shared service that gets injected. Mm -hmm. um, because you can declare services as singletons, they can maintain the state um, in that service. And then uh, any component you injected into can reference that state. Um, that's ideal for a state that isn't going to change. Uh, for instance, like a user service that initially fetches all the uh, associated user data when the app loads, and then it doesn't have to change. So any component that references it uh, just has the up-to-date data. Uh, where it sort of gets too complex is if that data can be changed by some other component and say a component in your header has to immediately reflect uh, like your message count. So now it has to subscribe to that, that state change. Um, and that's where sort of libraries like uh, Redux or Fluxer um, have gotten popular um, because it lets you create that central store that becomes that single source of truth and then um, you can declare all the components that need to subscribe to those changes. Um, but if you don't need something like that complexity, um, you can just use something like cascading parameters and put that at your app root level component mm -hmm. um, and then pass that down uh, to components that need it. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting you say that because that's kind of the advice I've heard too. It's like you want to pass properties down. So like if you have a component tree, you pass information down. But if you need to, uh, I guess, pass information back up, you signal up, right? You use events and, and things like that. So pass information down, signal up, back the tree. So um, I know that's kind of what the the chat is kind of asking. Like how do you how do you keep passing information back and forth? Uh, so just to kind of summarize what you said, services, signals, slash events, I guess, <laughs> in .NET. Uh, and I guess, uh, yeah, that answers that particular question. There was a lot of discussion in the chat about your particular style. Uh, folks were asking, like, why do you use private properties versus, like, public properties in components? Uh, do you find there's any particular uh, advantages to one over the other? Uh, and when do you use uh, you know, with each of them. Yeah, um, well, it, it really kind of goes back to the old, the age-old concept of um, sort of data encapsulation, because uh, it's still very kind of object-oriented. Like these components are essentially C# -sharp classes, and so if um, again you, you want to keep the the data or state isolated to where it's relevant. So um, just like on a normal class method, if um, other classes don't need to know about this state or be able to control it, then it should be private, right? And that mm -hmm. tells you that, oh, I can get, I can delete this if this component isn't using it because I know it's not used anywhere else. Um, and then um, you also kind of want to avoid just creating public properties um, on Blaze, on components. Um, if they really, if they truly are public, then they should generally be parameters. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise you kind of, get into some complicated rendering scenarios. Um, if you're able to change properties um, externally that aren't parameters, um, so you definitely wanna kind of be careful there. Um, yeah. If that makes sense. yeah, it makes total sense. And I, I think you mentioned too, like uh, it's fascinating, like you're probably one of our first guests to really talk about teams and like talk about team members uh, and kind of being respectful uh, when you create your components and not having like superfluous properties polluting the completion state. So I think that's probably another reason you don't want to do that. Like you just, you want to be a good team member. Uh, and I think that kind of really came across in your talk. Like it's not just about getting stuff done. It's about the long-term effects uh, of what you're doing. So um, I actually have a, I have a question for you. Uh, I was thinking about this. Uh, I'm, I don't do a lot of blazer. Uh, I do more like backend stuff, like you mentioned. Um, you know, React has hooks. So this idea of like taking common functionality and putting it somewhere, uh, is that available in Blazor? Uh, I know Razor has like tag helpers. Does that kind of exist in the Blazor world? Yeah, so well, those are, uh, you kind of mentioned like a couple of different concepts, I guess. Yeah. Um, so things like hooks um, are for um, sort of abstracting out this shared logic, um, mm -hmm. especially kind of like cross-cutting concerns. Um, there's not a concept directly like that in uh, Blazor. Um, and that's kind of an area where React and Blazor probably diverge the most, is that Blazor is still very uh, object-oriented focus, which makes sense uh, for uh, .NET. Uh, whereas React has moved more and more towards a functional approach. Um, and so now, instead of classes, their components are just functions. And hooks was their way to be able to layer in the shared functionality without something like inheritance uh, or mixins that you could apply to classes. And so the closest equivalent in Blazor is probably uh, just using services, because um, you can inject those easily. React also doesn't have any built-in concept of dependency injection, whereas that's become pretty core to .NET and .NET applications. Mm -hmm. so, uh, if you're used to uh, injecting services into different classes, then um, it essentially behaves the same with components. OK, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I guess when I was looking at, you know, uh, a really other popular thing in the chat was just encapsulating your components. Uh, I, I found it fascinating too, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, like, 
when you're building your applications and you're starting to kind of encapsulate your components, like how, how do you share that information with team members? I know in the JavaScript community, there's like uh, libraries like Storybook. Uh, Brendan Foster is kind of the godfather of atomic design as well. So like creating like these component libraries that you can kind of spin up and see. So as you're kind of wrapping your components and building this like specialized library, how does your team kind of share that knowledge and how do you iterate on that uh, as you kind of move forward? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's funny, I think the last time I gave this talk, Storybook came up as well. Um, <laughs> hopefully, um, that is one of the things um, I've missed on occasion um, from the, the JavaScript or the React community um, that I haven't found an equivalent uh, in the Blazor space. Mm -hmm. uh, so if anyone out there uh, wants to, uh, <laughs> Uh, take that on. I think there's definitely uh, some uh, some desire for that. Um, yeah, if we can nerd, if we can nerd snipe some people into building uh, a, a component library kind of book for Blazor, uh, then I think this talk has been successful. So. <laughs> exactly. Um, a kind of uh, workaround I've done on occasion, especially on some larger projects, um, uh, and where you have like designers. Uh, uh, involved kind of defining um, all these interactions is just creating a page within the application that's um, so like this design sheet that just samples all your components and then you can point people to like um, you know we can say like hey if you're looking for some kind of interaction or trying to build something check here first and see mm -hmm. um, just how we do things um, in the application and what you have available before trying to roll your own or um, extend things or pull, worse, pull in some other dependency. Yeah, I think, you know, that, that's that's awesome advice. I mean, I've worked on projects too, where you start to kind of get like a design language. And like, if you want to build a form or if you want to like pop up a modal, like you have examples that you can go and kind of copy that. Um, I, I think to your example too, wrapping the components just makes that a lot easier because like you just have a lot less markup that you kind of can use to build out those pages or those components. So I think for me, that's like probably the best tip in your whole talk. Um, there's a <laughs> lot of good tips in there, uh, but that's, that's the one that kind of like stuck out to me. Um, so you talked about replacing uh, like dependencies, um, like, do, what, like, tell me more about that particular story. Like, what, what was the story where you were like, somebody did, did somebody come to you and say, oh, we need to switch out this whole component library? Like, what was that about? Um, yeah, uh, well, it's rare that you'll get the requirement that's just like, no, we need to use a different library. But it's usually like some unforeseen requirements uh, will come up that you realize you just can't accomplish with. Um, the library you're using or the dependency, um, whether it's the date picker that um, now doesn't let you do some particular interaction that is vital to the client. Um, or in one instance, like we just didn't realize the modal wasn't accessible. Um, fortunately, that was its own dependency. So we just had to replace the modals. Um, another instance, the kind of uh, draconian de design team, the clients, decided um, that they want to switch from a bootstrap to a more material UI kind of look and feel. So we had to swap that out. Um, what's another one? Um, I have a um, ticket assigned to me right now, actually, where the client now wants every text field in the application to force all the text to uppercase. And so, <laughs> Um, not too terrible to implement, but if you didn't have just this uh, one text field component that is used everywhere, then you know that'd be a much bigger lift as opposed to right now. It's just changing. It'll literally be changing one razor file, um, mm -hmm. which to me is pretty cool. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, you talked a lot about accessibility, but you know, like a cousin of accessibility is typically like localization. Um, mm -hmm. Like, 
have you had any experience with localization in Blazor? Um, and if you have, what's your experience been in that space? I have not, unfortunately, yet. Um, um, the only kind of tip I have, though, from uh, previous projects is um, make sure to to try to suss that out first. Of of all the kind of like changes um, or changes in requirements, I found that one to be the worst in terms of because obviously you can't anticipate everything, um, and you can try to uh, you know make things like loosely coupled or uh, have some extra options ahead of time, but adding localization to a UI after the fact um, is just, it's a lot of work either way. Um, and it's not something you can really sort of half put in place maybe to make it easy to add on later, then it's just a lot of work. You might as well just add it, <laughs> localization. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, but no, I haven't uh, looked into that in Blazor. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's fascinating because I was when you were doing like the unit test part, I was thinking you're grabbing things by the label text and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously in a localization scenario, uh, a label text might go from English to Spanish to Cantonese, you know, so that, that might kind of break down if you're localizing a component. Um, but those ARIA described bys are never typically changed. So those are also good kind of attributes to kind of reach out by. So um, let me see here. I'm trying to find any other, you know, there's a lot of positive comments. Uh, one of the first ones was mentioned about Mudblazer and you mentioned that, that was really cool. Um, the thing that was like really fascinating and I saw a lot of the chat talking about was kind of the state machines, right? Using switch statements mixed with markup like how did you come? How did you get to that point? Uh, is that something you saw somewhere else, or is it something that just kind of came to mind uh, as you were writing Blazor? Yeah, um, that um, was definitely something I brought over from uh, uh, React projects. Um, I think it starts kind of simple enough. Um, JavaScript being a bit more um, fluid in terms of the uh, the kind of objects objects you can construct and then even with TypeScript the types you can define um, you can do some cool things where you can create sort of a map where instead of that switch statement um, I can have a map or essentially a dictionary where the key is each of those states and then it, each um, each item associated with that key is the markup that it should render. Um, so then I can, in the markup, I can get rid of the switch statement entirely and just have one line where I use the status as the key and then it returns the markup. Um, I haven't, um, haven't had a strong need for that pattern in Blazor yet, but I imagine it would be a bit tougher to do, um, with C-sharp's, uh, type system. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, definitely something to consider, um, because it, um, it, it simplifies that in a lot of ways. And at least with TypeScript, you can create these, define these union types where you say this, um, this dictionary say can only have these keys and it has to have all these keys. Mm -hmm. So that means that you know you're handling every state um, when you knew of one of those dictionaries. Yeah, I'm also curious, like um, you're talking about states, but like, switch statements have gotten a lot more powerful in C sharp. So I'm curious if pattern matching can kind of help evolve into more complex states. Right. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I guess it's for people out there to try out and, uh, see if it works for them, but it was really fascinating. I, I was also thinking like, it'd be cool if it was kind of, uh, put into the blazer syntax. So instead of having just one, uh, code section, you could also have state sections where like, if this component goes into the state, render this part or render this part. But I think we're in like fantasy world now, like <laughs> now we're just imagining things. So um, on that note, uh, do you have any last comments kind of before we wind down or um, anything you want to kind of say to the audience? 
this is your chance to yell those famous YouTube lines of smash that like button, ring that bell, anything. <laughs> Uh, go go for it, Brand. You can do it. Uh, check out my Patreon. No, um, <laughs> uh, no. I mean, um, this has been, um, you know, it's been fun. Um, I appreciate the uh, sort of platform and opportunity to uh, spread uh, this kind of information. To me, like the sort of cross pollinating ideas between different development communities uh, has always been really fascinating to me. Um, and that's what's so cool about the JavaScript community is because everyone has to write JavaScript. So you have JavaScript devs from Python and Ruby and um, just everything imaginable contributing to this shared space. So being able to come back and bring that into uh, C Sharp and Blazor, uh, it's a lot of fun. And um, I want to, again, uh, kind of be able to sort of turbocharge people's kind of learning path um, into a lot of these concepts. Like uh, a lot of these other communities have already learned these lessons and I'm sure um, they'll start to, as the Blazor community grows and uh, picks up usage, we'll start to see a lot of the same things. And um, the Blazor team themselves is always pulling in new stuff like error boundaries was something, a feature they added in .NET 6 that mm -hmm. came straight from React. Um, and so uh, I'm sure we'll see more and more of that so um, yeah, I just want to help people write better UIs because um, we have to use them when we <laughs> sign up for uh, airline tickets and stuff. So <laughs> yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. And uh, we definitely appreciate the cross pollination of ideas. And uh, yeah, so uh, on that note, uh, I'll share my screen and kind of wind down here. Thank you, folks. Um, hope you enjoyed that webinar. Uh, I, I did. Uh, I thought it was awesome. Brandon, great job. Uh, you're on your way to be a YouTube star. Uh, speaking of YouTube, uh, folks, um, you can watch more of our webinars at JetBrains TV, um, youtube.com, JetBrains TV. Uh, be sure to follow, follow us on Twitter at JetBrains uh, Rider. Uh, if you want to read any of our blog posts, you can go to jetbrains.com forward slash writer. Uh, or that's to go check out Rider itself. But if you want to read our blogs, you can go to blog.jetbrings.com forward slash dot net. That's our specific dot net blog, but we have other products as well. If you want to read those blogs, there's always some uh, cross pollinating features between our products. So definitely check those out as well. If you want to read more from Brandon, uh, he has a personal site, brandonpew.com, uh, and be sure to follow him on Twitter as well. Uh, and now this is the perfect time uh, to be a YouTube person. Uh, thanks for joining us. Go ahead, Brandon. You can say it. Go ahead and say it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, be sure to like and subscribe and uh, smash that like button. All right. Perfect. You're hired. <laughs> On that note, folks, thanks for joining us. Brandon, again, thank you so much. Uh, this is a great talk. You mentioned you're going to work on another talk. So if you want to come back, give that talk here. We'd be more than happy to have you. So awesome. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Check you later. <laughs>